Talking Sense listeners, thanks for tuning in to an amazing new episode. This week, we have Lars Nilsson, and Lars is the global SDR lead, or SVP, I believe, so big deal at Snowflake. If you haven't heard of Snowflake, you're under a rock. Um, he is also the CEO of SalesSource, which is a premier consulting firm helping people optimize their sales motion, but... What I think Lars is really known for is really pioneering and evangelizing the role of the SDR. So if the role of the SDR were to have a godfather, (laughs) to me, (laughs) it would be Lars. And so who better to talk all things SDRing than, you know, the guy who kind of wrote the playbook for it. So welcome, Lars. I hope I didn't embarrass you, but that's how I think about it, you know? No, not at all. I'm super prideful of uh, uh, the SDR role and function and um, what it has meant for most, if not all, surging high growth B2B SaaS companies. And so um, I'm equally, equally as excited about our time together this morning. Um, and I just can't wait to talk shop. I love it. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. So you've scaled a really large BDR team, and I'm not sure most companies even get to that level of scale. So like, walk me through how you've been able to achieve that. Yeah. uh, So thanks. Um, And I feel like I'm doing something I've never done before at Snowflake, and that is take a team of SDRs or BDRs from uh, 100 to beyond 200. Previous to, previous to my time at Snowflake, I had built four other SDR teams for other venture-backed companies, and they all reached about 100, which if, if you think about 100 SDRs that are typically overlaid, you know, to add one to three, um, you know, I started very small with these venture-backed companies, but they all eventually grew. And they grew on the back of the pipeline that was generated by SDRs. So I think um, as I look back at the support that I received, I got it from the CRO and the CMO and the executive leadership team. Um, When you start to see the pipeline that's coming from this very efficient, uh, effective motion, which is both inbound and outbound outbound demand generation, um, and you start to crunch the numbers, um, hopefully there are people, you know, at the, at the sea level that are taking notice. And, you know, if you think about one SDR can fill the pipeline of up to three reps, then it's easy to see that the headcount given to the SDR organization, all they're going to do is create pipeline and create those multiples that you need to create predictability in your business model, which is pipeline coverage. A um, lot, of, lot of that being discussed today in this downturn, how much pipeline you need in order to cover uh, the revenue number. And, you know, it turns out that the sales development rep, if properly onboarded and ramped and, and developed, they can do that. And uh, so that's what I've been, I've been rinsing and repeating this model um, from one startup to the other. And um, what, I'm, what we are doing at Snowflake, um, some of the most exciting times that I'm having in my career. So um, uh, it's, it's, it's a real deal, Atney. The real deal. So a couple questions. So you mentioned this ratio of three to one. Um, maybe explain that for the audience, like w- what that means and and how you think about those those ratios and and is three to one kind of what people should strive for? Yeah, it, it, it again, it all depends, but uh, depends. on average, right? If you consider that the sales development rep, this non quota carrying as far as uh, revenue, but they carry a quota for setting meetings. Um, if you can consider that one SDR can qualify first appointments into target accounts um, at a clip of anywhere from 10 to 30 a month, and they're overlaid to uh, a quarter-carrying sales force, 
uh, where most companies kind of triangulate around is one SDR for every three reps. Now, at the very beginning of a company's maturity cycle, where there's very little pipeline, they might decide to bring that ratio to one to two. I've even seen one to one. Uh, In other words, if you want to keep your sellers efficient and you want to keep them selling, negotiating and closing and not prospecting, then you staff up on the SDR side uh, so that the sales rep spends less time prospecting. And in my opinion, right? Two very different motions. Prospecting is very different from selling. Um, uh, and if you can take prospecting... Let's take a second and debate that. We, um, we, we, I, I think we should because there's a lot of people debating it right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think we should just take take a, a minute. And actually, one of, I, I had a guest um, in another episode, Amy... Um, Wallace, and we talked about this, and she said, I think AE should prospect. I think things are over segmented. And, you know, there's there's a piece of me that somewhat agrees. I think that I think AEs need to have a prospecting motion and still know how to do it. And I think you create a culture around prospecting. But I'll give you my argument and you you can throw it back. But I had two, there are two sides of the argument because I love, we call them BDRs. I love our BDRs. I think it's, a, I think it's been a linchpin to our success here. And, and it's two things. One, if you're going to double, it's all about hiring. And hiring right is very hard. It's a lot lower risk to hire an SDR. And promote them out. But that's not the only reason to have it. But I think that's an important part of it. If as you think about your uh, the company as a long term and being able to create a growth trajectory. And so I think that's really important. Um, but the second thing is, you know, the in the classic inbound motion is I don't want to say dead. It's not dead, but only 3% of your website visitors are going to fill out a form. Maybe if you're amazing, you can get it to 3.2 or 3.5, you know? And so what are you doing about the other 97%? So this is the marketer's point of view. I spend so much money on advertising and my website and my content to, to, uh, to capture this 97, but they don't fill out a form. The only way to engage that other 97 to like finish the process in my mind is an outbound motion. Otherwise you're literally pouring a ton of dollars on the ground. And so that's how I think of it as like completing almost like a a journey um, to actually get a prospect to engage, which is a lot harder that no one's willing to trade engagement for a piece of content anymore. They need more. So that's kind of how I I think about it. But I'd love to hear um, your point of view. Yeah, I would say that at Snowflake, 97% of our energy and effort is a given to the outbound motion. So I think you and I are in alignment. Again, we um, at Snowflake, we have a very, uh, we're very focused on account-based motions. Um, we have an entire team within marketing named account-based marketing. Uh, They have a director level leader. They have 25 to 30 account-based marketing managers that are overlaid to the field. And we are doing very modern, very targeted campaigns against our targeted addressable market and our ideal customer profile. And most of that is cold outbound, um, used to warm up our target accounts so that the SDR can draft in on that motion three to four weeks later with a even more targeted, more personalized message in hopes of getting a conversion, getting someone to raise their hand and say, yep, I'll take that meeting. And when but we that's use the, the right way to do it. I, I think maybe perhaps the debaters have had it, have seen it not work when it's not, it can be colossally expensive and inefficient if you don't set it up right. Well, and that's, 
Um, what I've seen in my consulting practice, going into companies that have tried to deploy an SDR model, tried to deploy an account-based marketing model. And these, <laughs> I mean, you know more than anyone because you sell technology that enables this. It's hard. Even if you have the technology, you have to have expertise in-house someone that has done this before and understands the power of what a platform like Sixth Sense can provide. Um, there are so many moving parts to this and points of orchestration between departments, to pain, between levels before you even get started. So I think you're right. It's uh, very hard to do this elegantly. Um, it's very hard to do this um, and get the kind of, but you can. We are executing at a level at Snowflake that's generating, I mean, together with account-based marketing, the sales development team is uh, responsible for about 70% of global pipeline generation. Um, and the majority of that and is- And that's not a alcohol. small number, folks. That, and the Don't majority- look at their earnings. <laughs> that, but, 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 but Latney, the, the majority of that is due to our outbound motions. Again, inbound, yes, we do get- Existing of customers course. and and active prospects that are engaging with our content and our uh, you know events and but most of that follow up again we use a very uh, uh, well developed inbound lead to account matching uh, platform so that these inbound leads it's not like they're going into a queue and waiting for an SDR to research uh, triage and then call back right they're getting routed through and going into the right buckets of the people who should be uh, following up on them, whether that's an account owner or an SDR. Uh, nothing is left to chance. Um, everything is very, very well orchestrated, both inbound and outbound. Um, the only place where we see things maybe backing up are inbound leads against non-target accounts. Yeah. And, you know, we've, I've sat with marketing and sales and operations, and we've decided together that these are the accounts we want to go after. And these, if they come inbound, are not something that are worthy of anyone's time, energy, or effort, but we will uh, orchestrate a very a very personalized, uh, intentional um, uh, 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 nurturing campaign, right? Drip nurturing, where if we present you with an offer and you click yes, yeah, then it'll get rerouted to the an SDR, but if they're just kicking tires and they want to consume our content, we'll leave them in that uh, nurturing campaign until they decide they're ready and they raise their they raise their okay. hand. Okay, so this is such this is such an important point because account based is as much who you go after and spend time on as who you don't, and I think a lot of people don't realize that. and And the only thing that we have ultimately is, is our time. And so having a thoughtful process for the non-target, and like, like you said, it's not, you're not blowing them off. It's just a thoughtful process that isn't resource intensive because you don't want to deploy resources against non-target accounts. You know, no, and a I lot mean, of people don't think about that. You, well, if you're just getting out of the gate, if you're listening to this and you're a really early stage companies and you... You probably want to take every bat that yeah, you, you want to well, every ball. <laughs> you, you want to learn what is resonating with uh, people that, that care. And if, if someone's coming inbound and you've, they're a different persona at a company that you're not, in, it, is in a different vertical or a different segment, um, always interesting to learn. Uh, but I think as a company matures, you have to put time uh, away to get with your cross-departmental uh, partners and decide uh, the accounts we want to go outbound to. These are the accounts we truly and honestly believe have the problem that our solution can solve. And these are the personas, early stage, mid-cycle, late stage, where our messaging, our content, our outreach is going to resonate with them. We're very focused at Snowflake to make sure we're going after the right persona at the beginning of a campaign versus who we decide we're going to reach out to in the middle of a sales campaign once we've, uh, you know, brought that target into uh, our, our selling motion. Mm. Um, so in your practice, you, you've, you obviously know what, lo what good looks like. 
but you've seen a lot of pitfalls along the way. What are like the top three things that you're like, here's where you fall down in setting this thing up? Yeah. So if I were to be interviewing with a company right now, I'd want to know that the executive leadership team, certainly the CEO and the CMO, the CRO and the CFO, if they don't understand what an SDR or a BDR does and what their function is, and I would stay away. They have to, in my opinion, have to understand and respect uh, this modern, very modern take on demand gen is. Um, and not all, not all executives do, right? They will, might relegate it to some, you know, random part of the company. And that comes to my second thing is where do you put it? Do you put it in marketing or do you put it in sales? Age old again, debate. Age old hot, debate. Hotly <laughs> debated topic. And I feel really strongly about this. I don't necessarily care if one or the other. I just want the leader um, of the group that BDRs are going into to respect and understand the role. Uh, because if they don't, then they won't give it the leader a title they deserve. They won't give the organization um, freedom to create comp compensation um, and design comp plans that drive the kind of uh, attention. Um, and uh, so I think it has a lot to do with, I mean, most of my career at Latney, I've rolled up to sales, but at Snowflake, I report up to Denise Pearson, our CMO. And I sit in the same room building uh, Slack channels um, and my teammate is runs account-based marketing. And everything we do, our go-to-market is together. Um, mm -hmm. And we leave very little to chance. Uh, we orchestrate and script and strategize together on every program uh, that we do globally uh, when it in involves both account-based marketing and account-based sales development. And when those two are orchestrated and combined, we see a three, uh, a three times pickup rate on our, our meetings booked. Um, mm. Now we don't have, uh, we have way more SDRs than we do account-based marketers. So um, our yeah, SDRs- Yeah, I was wondering, it's like a pod structure. So we yeah. have the ratio three to one. I wonder what the ratio of an account-based marketer to, like, I wonder what that is. It's maybe like well, I mean, we've one got to two, twelve or something. Is it like yeah, an we've got, high well, RVP? That, that's that, that's a that's a new metric. Uh, we yeah, have about yeah, two, we're making stuff up. I love it. <laughs> yeah, we have two hundred and fifty SDRs at Snowflake, and I think we have twenty five ABMers, um, and we're now beginning to take our account based marketing motions um, and draft into EMEA and also account uh, in our Asia Pacific region which is brand new to this motion. So we're just getting going in account, excuse me, in, in our Asia Pacific region and really excited about uh, the potential uh, to use this really powerful um, outbound motion of warming up personas and targets for an eventual body slam by the SDR team. Love it, love it. So you've been doing this a while. Um, how has it evolved? Like when you look at 10 years ago, five years ago to now, how has the function matured, changed? Yeah, I actually look at it as before sales engagement and after sales engagement. <laughs> Some more um, BC, AD, AD, BC. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, uh, before sales engagement came onto the scene, and I'm, I'm talking about these kind of cadence sequence uh, mm -hmm. was started by ToutApp and Yesware were the two companies and then in comes Outreach and SalesLoft. And now it feels like everyone um, has a sales engagement technology or platform. But before that, um, things were done relatively the same way. You had email and you had phone. <laughs> um, today <laughs> with these sequencing tools, you can add other channels like sending uh, platforms, uh, right? And um, social has become um, an even more LinkedIn touches and uh, follows and likes and shares um, has become a way for the SDR to learn more about their target so that they can personalize their, their outreach. And that has become the game changer is grabbing someone's attention 
with a subject line and a hook or the first sentence and getting someone to read what it is that you want them to understand about you and your solution. And in that way, educate and inspire someone to raise their hand. And that was made way more personal and possible, I believe, with the sales engagement platforms, the modern ones that we all use today. Um, the other thing that has changed, when I was building teams in the 90s, I was hiring people you know, my age in their 40s, 50s, and 60s who were former AEs that just didn't want to travel. But they wanted to be in the game and they loved talking and qualifying. Today, it is almost pivoted towards career changers and young professionals coming out of college that want to learn how to sell in, 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 a, in, a, in a technology environment. And so uh, today, I would say that 75% of my team, uh, they're in their early to mid-20s, and they're looking to get a start. They're looking to get uh, you know, their money motivated. And uh, someone told them that, hey, learn how to sell. Uh, these are skills that are transferables in life. But um, if you come into a program, into a company like a Salesforce.com, which I know has a great onboarding enablement and training program for SDRs, we do at Snowflake as well. Um, but take your career, get developed, get a frontline sales uh, manager who cares about you and learn, learn a new skill. Um, today, we're graduating and promoting about 25 SDRs every quarter, Latiny, into either quota carrying inside sales roles or other roles within the company, whether they be in the, our partner group or our marketing group or operations. I don't know if you've done this. I'm sure you have because you guys are snowflake, but we did an analysis of our graduates and it's pretty amazing what they go to do. I mean, they really go to become top performers. Um, the skills around, you know, I think grit and um, listening and communication that you develop in that role serve you well in so many other aspects of, of the, the business. That was a fun analysis to do. So if you have a BDR team and you've graduated some cohort, them versus peers. Um, and it, it's, it, I don't know, it's neat to see. Well, I mean, there's some of the highest energy, high output, high activity people that exist. Um, and it, it's, it's often the case where one of my SDRs will realize after 12 or 15 months that carrying a quota and having the pressure of that kind of performance month in, month out, quarter in, quarter out is not for them. The really cool thing for us at Snowflake is we have other places for them to go. And so um, SDRs are now proliferating across the company into lots of different types of roles. And we absolutely want to keep them. So I feel very lucky that we're at the scale now at Snowflake where and, and we have leaders in, in partnership, in sales engineering, in operations, that once they got their hands on one of an SDR, <laughs> they, they want more. And again, everyone wants a Lars graduate. Well, I, I mean, the point is, I think for companies is the SDR team becomes a legitimate talent pipeline into the company. Mm -hmm. Now, we want most of them to go into quota caring sales because yeah. uh, to get a hold of a ramped, cultured, um, high energy person that already knows the company, the operation, the culture the, the time to ramp is uh, much quicker than uh, the external externals that we're hiring. Um, so, you know, the flywheel is going. Again, 25 to 30 graduates every quarter from SDR into other parts of the company is, uh, is a real game changer. Uh, yeah, no, and, absolutely. And, and, and the call out for, for those of you listening, if you don't have a place for your SDRs to go after 12 to 18 months, they will leave you and bring everything you gave them to another company. And that's, I think, the, the message is, do you have a place, another place for an SDR to get promoted into or to graduate to? Because if you don't, um, and again, some young companies, the, 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 the leap from SDR to AE is, is too far. And, uh, you know, we have segmented our sales organization. So we do have a corporate 
account mm-hmm. exec team. Mm-hmm. And it's the perfect landing place for an SDR that has proven themselves over the last 18 months. Agreed. Agreed. Let's go back to just enabling uh, an SDR, right? Because you talked about, you know, they're going to use LinkedIn and they're going to inspire someone to want to have a conversation with them. And that's a big ask for someone who may be switching careers or relatively new to the workforce. So how do you get them ready to be able to go and do that? Well, this is why I took this job. Um, and if I can take the audience back 37 years to when I graduated from college, my first job out of college was, was with a company called Xerox. I ended up selling copiers, typewriters, and fax machines. But what they did is Xerox put me through a six to 12 month onboarding enablement and training program where You know, I went to different centers around the country and learned how to qualify. I learned how to present, handle objections, negotiate, close, all the things that are skills and activities that you need to learn, but they're, you can teach them. Um, And so what I'm doing today at Snowflake, we announced last year the Snowflake Sales Development Academy. And it's just, uh, we've branded our onboarding program it's purpose built from the ground up with the SDR in mind. So we're not putting our SDRs into a uh, kind of a, a, a globally watered down onboarding where sales engineers and marketers and sellers are going in and learning about the product and right. the process. This is four weeks where they go in and it is, uh, it's guided, it's live. Uh, we even have contracted with, you know, the world's best cold call trainer. Uh, you may, um, uh, uh, who's an external who comes in and uh, teaches our SDRs how to cold call. And uh, so after four, four weeks, they have everything they need to do their job. Um, the gentleman's name is Josh Braun, for those of you uh, that are interested. He's a contractor, comes in, and every single month when we have a class, he comes in and teaches them how to cold call. Um, we use a lot of content from John Barrows and Beck Holland Mm-hmm. on how to seek, set up the right sequences. Um, uh, and then after that month, they go into their role as, a, as an SDR, and they have a 15-month period where we continue that education and begin to develop them after 12 months into sales reps. And so we have courses and training sessions to mature them so that when they do and decide they want to go into quota occurring sales, they have an understanding of those skill sets, negotiating how to do a great first discovery call, how to pre-call plan and post-call plan, all those types of skills. And your vision, ultimately, my understanding is to be able to package this up so like non-Snowflake people can go through it. Is that correct? Well, that is absolutely my vision. And back in the day, Xerox used to white label and resell their training. I absolutely have that as a dream and a vision of mine. Well, so we're sign us up. That, yeah. Sign us up. I'm sure all these listeners are like, just let us know when, Lars. We're ready. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, Latney, you think about all of the platforms, technologies, and processes and procedures at an SDR. I mean, it's Salesforce, it's Outreach, it might be Speckit, Troops, Chili Piper, Zoom Info. I mean, the number of services that they and platforms they have to access in any given day. I mean, it's anywhere from five on the low end to 13 to 15 on the high end. You need to enable and train and develop that talent. And so I think it's more important for a company to put resources into the development of an SDR than anyone else, because right, you want to inspire them to understand exactly what to do when they get up every morning. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what we're aiming to do. I don't want to leave anything to chance. Um, but then as they grow and they get their feet under them, they start to get the creative juices flowing. We have a lot of SDRs use, using LinkedIn video right now, very uh, productively and very effectively. And we're developing a little bit of a, what we call a Hall of Fame. A Hall oh, of Fame. Cool. The tell, tell, tell me about that. Because well, you know, we have BDR Appreciation Week coming up in March. So, well, I love it. Uh, any ideas like, to like, you know, promote the function, promote the individuals? So, what, what tell us about the Hall of Fame? 
Well, the Hall of Fame, so uh, we have Gong, so our conversational intelligence platform, and we have some, uh, the very best, you know, uh, accepted cold call that executed. And we also have kind of a fun pile, like the worst ones, if you're oh, an yeah. SDR yeah, and you're, and, and you're willing and able to show people how you messed up. But again, but um, that's part of, I think, building resilience and, you know, um, especially in that role, you have to be okay being a vulnerable. Absolutely. But again, if you think about here are the best outreach sequences based on reply rates or based on um, uh, uh, open rates, um, uh, based on subject line, based on how many touch points. Mm -hmm. um, and so we now have very curious account executives that are understanding that the emails that we are curating and that we are writing and, and how we get them out, when we get them out, how they're personalized. AEs are taking notice and um, asking to have access to our Hall of Fame uh, so they can see what really, really good looks like. And that's again, good. But, that's creating that culture of prospecting that yeah. I talked about. I think that's great. I mean, before Gong, we would have to, we have a rookie cord and an SDR would get on and just listen to live calls. And, you know, it might take two hours so you know, get to get a good one and a bad one. Yeah. Now we can say, listen to these 10 recorded calls, you know, and in a half an hour, they understand exactly what kind of good looks like. And we can also mm -hmm. send them, and here's what maybe you want to stay away from. Um, <laughs> and it just, uh, it's a game changer in the onboarding and enablement. Um, having Gong and having platforms like Outreach. Um, uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So let's talk about, this is a little bit of a nit, but um, it comes up a lot with email and like the difference between marketing email and sales email. So, you know, maybe just take a second and, you know, I, I have to even coach my team. Like that's a marketing email like this. It needs to come from a person like yeah. that's that's a big part of the difference. Um, so I don't know how you like coach to that or or well, it's uh, one of those traps I've seen that like a great marketing email is not a great sales email. Yeah. So what we do, we uh, again, I talked about not leaving too much to chance. Um, we realize that in writing cold when writing emails that are going cold out to target personas, we have to personalize um, and we also have to be relevant to the person, the role that they're in and the vertical in the company and what, what it is uh, they're doing. Um, and so we pull together, we call it the, a content committee, but it's made up of product marketers, subject matter experts, and we find those in the sales engineering organization. Um, SDRs, uh, SDR leaders, and a sales rep and a district manager. And so we, we're cross-functionally sales, product, marketing, and operations come together, and they very intentionally write these sequences. Oh, so you see so crowdsource and then I'm sure test. Crowdsource we do. The, the one part that we leave to the SDR's creativity is the personalization. And what yeah. they'll do is they'll spend time researching whether or not they can triangulate based on where they might know this person and get an introduction, you know, through someone that they're connected to uh, that's the, you know, in their orbit, or it's based on uh, personalization around uh, what they found in their LinkedIn profile or uh, on the World Wide Web just by doing a Google search and kind of attracting... Or in data. How, yeah. like, what, what they're... What have they been doing, right? What's their research show? Um, and, you know, when you're a brand new SDR, it takes a good three to six months for you to be able to go off on your own and be cleared for takeoff and write your own emails. Um, again, sentence structure, punctuation. I mean, uh, every SDR <laughs> has had... We've seen some really bad ones. We've seen some bad ones. Well, yeah. Hello, first name. Uh, still, oh. It still happens. It happened to be last week. Um, uh, but... So, uh, and, and I think that if you're going to get serious about cold outbound and, and using modern account-based motions, take the time, put one of these committees together so that you have inputs from marketing and sales 
Um, but get a subject matter expert because nothing reeks of watered down marketing than a bunch of pithy uh, acronyms. But I call it a word salad, a word yeah. salad. <laughs> But, but I mean, have the, in, you know, be intentional and use the language and use the verbiage and the acronyms of the vertical that you're trying and the people that you're trying to attract. Um, so personalization on that part, on the persona is, is, is really important. And we crowdsource that for sure. Okay, let's talk about metrics. You've got 200 SDRs all rolling up to you. I'm sure there's all layers of dashboards and metrics that you use. So maybe let's let's just walk through first line BDR, what are their metrics? Manager, VP, all the way up to you. Like what are you looking at to make sure that you're running an efficient shop? Yeah, I'm excited to run through this. I uh knowing that you were going to ask this question, That's I went good. into and again we have three lines of leadership at Snowflake, right? 250 person organization. We've got about 22 frontline SDR leaders reporting up into uh, four second line directors that all report up to me. Um, and I'm just going to list uh, the metrics that our frontline leaders use. So Love input it. metrics. Uh, actually, one of the most important ones we uh, look at are contacts added to sequence. Um, how many contacts are added to the sequence? Uh, the number of accounts we're engaging. Again, we do a lot of outbound account-based marketing. So the number of accounts we're engaged, number of sequence steps skipped, number of overdue sequence steps. Mm. Again, we're very prescriptive, but very intentional about using our outbound approaches. And so we have a lot of metrics around them. Um, as far as efficiency metrics, sequence prospect to meeting percentage, percentage uh, sequence bounce rate, sequence bounce rates, um, call connect percentages, email reply rates. Um, pretty standard when you're a, a, a outbound uh, uh, account based sales development operation. Um, prospects worked to meeting percentage. Um, output metrics are uh, how are we pacing to quota on a daily and weekly basis, uh, above or below, uh, number so of meetings. Stop. Those are the, in, you're using those to ascertain, are they doing the right things and, and, and are the things that they're doing working, right? So great that they made so many calls. Are they actually connecting or, you, you know, so, so it's like, it, those are sort of effective, but also are they doing the right things? Would That's exactly right. And it's informing because, you know, we'll have, right, every SDR is created slightly differently, even though we put them through a training. And mm -hmm. um, these are metrics to inform and to give us signals on what's working and what isn't. So the beautiful thing about using a sales engagement platform is you can A-B split test at every level. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, uh, those metrics are used to inform of how we're going to uh, course correct and get better. Mm -hmm. um, okay, but, so now uh, the output, what you expect to get. Yeah, uh, obviously, you know, um, meetings to opportunity percentage, how many opportunities have been qualified, obviously the uh, pipeline created in dollars, um, closed one, um, number of opportunities, closed close one uh, dollars. Um, so very traditional. As, as you go up from there, some of the things that I'm uh, more connected to and not worried about, but tracking mm -hmm. um, all around hiring. Like if I've got an open headcount, um, whether it's at the IC level or the manager level, I switch most of my focus to make sure that um, I don't have open headcount just sitting there. Um, I'm also concerned with promotion rates. We're at the type of scale where I do, I want to see my SDRs progress through their um, SDR careers, but then, um, you know, let's get them up and out into other organizations. Um, we have a very uh, focused effort here around diversity and inclusion. And so um, I spend time uh, looking at those uh, metrics. Attrition rates. Um, we lose people uh, not only to other parts of the organization, which is a positive one, but when they leave, I want to understand why, right? Regrettable versus non-regrettable. 
um, uh, ramping statistics, how quickly. Um, when we joined, when I joined a little over two years ago, um, the average time to ramp for an SDR was somewhere between three and six months. As we've implemented and uh, developed our Snowflake Sales Development Academy, we've gotten that down to two to four weeks. Oh, wow. Um, and again, uh, a lot of that has to do with right the enablement and the onboarding. And mm-hmm. uh, we don't put them on quote until after they come out of and go through the academy, which is a month long. Um, on the, uh, as far as a new hire onboarding. And so, uh, yeah, we've been able to get ramp times, um, you know, cut in a third. Um, and, and, and that's meaningful. Uh, no, that is, especially if they're going to be with you 13 to 15 months. Yeah. That's yeah. really meaningful. Um, so- the other thing that we, uh, just last one, it's more anecdotal, but, um, I want my frontline leaders to have relationships with the account executives that their SDRs are overlaid to and also the district managers. So anecdotally, how are we doing? We do surveys. Mm-hmm. We do like stand an MPS. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, no doubt about it. But again, um, with, with 250 plus SDRs, I want to make sure that what we're putting out there is of quality, not just the individual, but the work that they're doing. So, Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, uh, I don't know if we're going to talk about it, but there's this thing called the dead zone. That was my next question. I'm like, we got to talk about the dead zone. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, when you deploy an SDR motion, right, you're, you're basically, you have to put in there the process and the procedure to hand off a meeting that an SDR has booked Mm-hmm. Um, into an AE's calendar, and then that has to ne- that meeting has to execute, um, and then there's got to be follow up. And capturing all of that motion and all of that handoff is probably one of the hardest and most debated topics in our world. Yes, um, because I spend a lot of time on the dead zone. Should this progress? Is right. should it go back? Should it be? Should they? Because another thing about the dead zone I found is sometimes AEs will hold on to something in an early stage, and I'm like, progress it or kill it. Like <laughs> the well, tweener state is not good. Yeah, um, and that's that you just talked about the the tweener zone. What are we doing here? Um, and again, there and this lies into what a marketer can control and what a sales development rep can control. We can control inputs like leads and events that are, you know, and touch points and uh, touch patterns and outbound. SDRs can book meetings. But what happens when a meeting executes and whether an AE decides to, you know, take that stage and put it into a sales qualified opportunity or hold on to it and, and put a zero dollar amount to it or some low dollar amount or put a random close date way out in the future because they want to <laughs> three years from now bottom. close dates. And you know, these are uh, strategies um, that are being used, but they're out of our control. Um, and we have marketers and SDR leaders uh, at Snowflake that are sitting there wondering, well, what's happening? Give us the opportunity to remarket that, re redo that with specific uh, pieces of, of feedback that we can use or move it up because you are actively in a campaign and you're trying to continue to qualify and sell. But keeping it in this middle kind of tweener or dead zone um, is not really helping anyone. Um, um, and I've seen a lot of people create new statuses and stages for that, but you're just kind of kicking the can down the road. And yeah, I think it's so funny. We're going through this right now. I'm like, do we, is there a 1A and a 1B? Well, exactly. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And again, that's just um, worsening. So what do you do? Zone. What's the answer? How do you eliminate the dead zone? Well, I think it's enablement, training, adoption, and accountability. Um, and again, I provide a lot of reports and dashboards that show this phenomenon. And, um, you know, we all have to pull up our big person pants and be honest uh, about why it isn't or why it is and give the feedback. All we want in SDR land is why it did or why it didn't, because then we can use that and get better. But if it well, goes yeah. in and just stays there and you don't give us a good answer, um, then 
you know, and I'm not going to call out that there's bad behavior in every single one of these, but um, give the process the respect it deserves and prosecute that first meeting and then decide what you're going to do with it. And your process should have what are the next steps? Or if you're not going to progress it, then give the SDR uh, guidance. Don't so need this to- might be a tad aggressive, but <laughs> at my last company, we had a take out the trash dashboard <laughs> just for stuff like that. Close date in the past, you know, for, you know, it, it's been open for 700 days, you know, yep. like all that stuff. And then I would give out, I was in, I was a sales leader at the time, but I would give an, a, a little trash can award. <laughs> That's so good. So good. So we, 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 call, we call ours the, 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 the hygiene dashboard. Um, yeah. They're all different so ways of saying <laughs> This is the one you don't want to be on. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but again, the I want the relationship that the SDR has with the AE. That's like the sacred coveted. You need to nurture that. Yeah. At the same, I want my SDR, frontline SDR leaders to be aligned in that same way to their uh, frontline sales. Yeah, I think the SDR manager. leaders and you are the ones that need to bring the trash forward in that type of way so that the you know, again, the SDR can't be feel like they're tattling on there. That wouldn't work at all. You right. know, right? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, we're all we're all adults. We're all professionals. We're all trying to get this company that we love and that we want to, um, you know, see do well and leapfrog the competition. So, same jerseys, rowing in the same direction. Let's help each other out. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But it's you know, as you get the best time to put policy and process and procedure around this is early days. Uh, once you get to 10 plus sales reps, you start to see some of this. Well, that's um, when the bad behavior really, yeah. it's, it's not just a trash can. It's like a right. landfill. <laughs> I mean, this is also like, if you don't have operations people that understand how to snuff this out and how to at least report on it, because as my job uh, at Salesforce as a consultant, when I used to go into companies, I, the first thing I would do is, you know, say, I want to take a look at your CRM and uh, understand the KPIs, metrics, dashboards. And they weren't, you know, most companies, because they're not looking for this, they don't have decision support mm -hmm. for their leaders to understand that it even exists. Mm -hmm. um, and so you start to weave a web of spaghetti in your CRM and your uh, sales engagement and your marketing automation platform. And next thing you know, no one's really talking uh, to each other. Um, and you just, everyone now is siloed and doing their job. And then when things go wrong, okay. people start pointing fingers. But anyway, so I think the time to tackle this is early, early days. So for the people that are reading, uh, listening to this that are in operations, um, get your marketing leader, get your sales leader, put them <laughs> right, together right. And, <laughs> and, and, and decide on this part of it because it's an important, important piece for sure. So two more questions. Um, one is about confidence. So we're talking a lot about confidence right now at, at Sixth Sense um, with our customers and, and how they can be confident um, despite any economic headwind. And so I like to ask people personally, like what, what makes you confident that you can get up and do an awesome job every day? Uh, wow, going deep, Latin. I love it. Um, so the, where my mind goes first to this is, uh, and so I have, and you, you talked about the word grit earlier. I have a different take on it. Um, it's not a different take. It's just a different way of saying it. I call it fire in the belly. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's that thing that I don't know if we're born with it or where we pick it up, but it's, uh, right. You're self starter, you're self motivated. Mm -hmm. And I've always been that way. And it, I, I found myself attracted to performance sales, um, quarter caring sales, sales leadership, um, I think because of it. And what I've always done since and the people that I'm hiring onto my team, I want them to have this safe, the same self-motivated, confident, high self-esteem. So at Snowflake, I'm starting with people that I have hand-selected that have this. 
Um, I think it's tough to get confidence um, later on, and I'm kind of going everywhere. We may want to cut this part out, but um, yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm, it's that uh, intrinsic, I'm, and maybe it's like the attraction of others like that that is inspiring, like that feeds you to see others with that same fire. Yeah, well, recognition and reward, I think, plays a big part in uh, level of confidence. Um, certainly, as I look back at my 37-year career, when I got pats on the back and I got awards and I got recognized and I got promoted, these were all things that drove me. Um, we spend a lot of time at Snowflake coming up with different challenges, with different team spiffs. We have a global uh, contest. I actually have two of them. Um, I try to do a lot of things that motivate, uh, that engender this kind of confidence and, and let's get out of bed and let's get after it early and work long, hard and smart and let's do it as a team. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the culture on a team. Again, when you come out of the Snowflake Sales Development Academy, you go to a team that has a culture already and it's anywhere from six to 10 people. And there's a, frontline leader that is a professional that is trained that is also going to become your coach and your mentor. And I think having those things in place instill confidence in someone. There are a lot of companies today, Latney, that don't have onboarding, that don't have professionally trained frontline leaders. Um, and they're kind of flying by the seat of their pants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think having an organization that has seasoned executives that has process, procedure, culture, uh, right? And, you know, your average early stage startup, you really have to understand what you're going into because you're not going to get a lot of direction, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to be thrown into the deep end. Um, I don't want that for my individual contributor, new hires at Snowflake. I want them to learn and see what really, really good looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and then release them into the wild, uh, enabled and trained so they feel confident when they you know, wake up in the next morning and they make that first cold call, they're going to have, you know, uh, flies in their stomach, but they're going to get over it and they're going to have listened to others that messed up and they're going to realize that's okay. I'm going to try again. And I think that's like how that I... that Xerox yeah. experience was very formidable for you. Because oh, th that's no. what the confidence thing is coming back to. Like, you had that and you want to give that to this next generation. That's what I am hearing, which I think is so cool. Yeah, I, I had to memorize a 17-page demo script of the 10, 50, 52 copier. And literally, we had to do it verbatim. It took me, I think, six weeks. But then I got up in front of my peers and I gave... Uh, it was probably an hour long demo scripted word for word. When I was able to do that, yeah, I, I can't, I, you know, I passed over a lot of personal and professional kind of hurdles, uh, that created confidence that I could do this. And, and yeah, uh, we try to do the same, um, in our academy. So I, I think that's a big piece of it. Lad. So last question. We learn more from our mistakes than from our success. Biggest mistake that you've learned the most from, or just a mistake? Don't, biggest yeah, mistake well, that's like too hard to think about. Just a mistake that you've yeah, made. I've made every mistake in the book professionally, um, whether it's hiring. But um, if I look back at my uh, career in the Valley, which has been twenty five years, uh, ten years before that, I was selling, but not technology. Um, I got a bit lost and wound up in this whole kind of venture backed high growth got to be traveling everywhere qbrs um building teams globally and i will i'll tell you right here that i uh lost my focus on what i had at home um in my personal life um and it wasn't until i had an opportunity to lift my head up, which was probably 10 plus years later that I realized. And again, right at the time I was married, I had kids, but I was burning it on every end. And I didn't understand 
that you have to take a breath sometimes and you have to push away and you have to take time. Um, uh, we are spending way more time on mental and emotional and physical health today, um, but we didn't back then. And I'll be mm -hmm. the first one to say that I uh, should have pushed back from the desk, uh, not taken um, as many trips as I did and focused more on what I had at home because that is absolutely the most important. Um, for me, it's health, family. For some, I've learned that it's their spirit, spirituality. And then a distant third or fourth is work. Um, you still have to, you know, uh, bring it at work, but uh, health and family come first. And I think that would be, as I look back, doing way better today. Um, but uh, for those of you listening, you know, understand whether it's a dog or it's an aging mother or it's a partner or it's a five kids, whatever it is you have, take care of it, nurture it, and uh, make sure you take time away from the business uh, to have that squared away and that you're putting energy into it. Thank you so much for sharing that. You know, I think for folks listening, obviously, we have someone who is still performing amazingly, still has, as you put it, a fire, you know, big fire in the belly, but is also okay making time and making that commitment. And I think, you know, seeing that, that's a great example for folks that are maybe worried that they can't allow themselves that. Um, and, you know, so thank you for sharing that. I think that's such an important point. And, Thank you for an awesome episode. I mean, we covered so much ground. I really felt the passion that you have around the sales development function, setting it up for success, the enablement and how these are really the future of Snowflake and beyond. Um, you know, the future sales team, the future marketing team, you guys obviously have a very, very tight process and enablement that, you know, we, we can all strive for. So I really appreciate you sharing all of the details of that and just had a lot of fun getting to know you better, Lars. Thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate that, Ladney. I've been uh, watching and following you for years, probably without you knowing it. And so this is a bit of a fanboy moment for me to be on this. And I really, really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> you're, you, and just, it. I need you to know that you're the the, the messaging and the content and what is coming from you personally, professionally, and what you're sharing with the world, it, it it's meaningful. Um, and I've heard from others that we're both close to that we share connections with. Um, you're um, uh, you're a, you're a big deal to a lot of people, and there's a lot of people looking up to you, and I'm one of them. So thanks for having me on, that. Oh, back at you, right? <laughs> we're this this. This stuff is hard. <laughs> We've got to learn and grow together. That's the only way to, to transform the industry. So awesome session. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. And, you know, we'll be back at it with another great guest in another week. Cheers. Cheers.